This reading, taken from Mind and Evolution, as assessed through reviews of major texts, will concern the origin of species, 6th edition. By Charles Darwin, 1872. This text impresses me as the labor of a supremely gifted naturalist, unaware of his deficiencies as a scientist. His strategy is to validate his claims, is invariably to amass illustrations. He says, to treat this subject properly, a long list of dry facts ought to be given. This subject can be treated properly only by giving long catalogues of facts. The great mass of examples he provides in support of his claims may disguise the thinness of his arguments, but it can't by itself validate them. Darwin's reliance on examples to validate his claims prompted his mental Sedgwick's criticism that Darwin had the process of scientific discovery upside down. Instead of deducing from everything that was known what is to be accounted for, and then coming up with a corresponding mechanism, Darwin had come up with his mechanism first, and supposed he could then prove it true by weight of confirming observations. Darwin continues to admit as much in the sixth edition, for I am well aware that scarcely a single point is discussed in this volume on which facts cannot be adduced, often apparently leading to conclusions directly opposite to those at which I have arrived. For his mechanism, Darwin didn't have far to look. In Zoonomia, his grandfather Erasmus Darwin had laid down his path for him. Erasmus wrote, Every individual tree produces innumerable seeds, and every individual fish innumerable spawn in such inconceivable abundance as would in a short space of time crowd the earth and ocean with inhabitants. This argument only shows that the productions of nature are governed by general laws. Such a law lay ready to hand in the relation, well known in Charles Darwin's time, between a city's population and its food supply established by Malthus. A city's population increases as the square of any increase in the perimeter where the food supply is. Eventually, as population increases, increase in the supply of food cannot keep up and excess individuals must either migrate away or die. Darwin had only to take that law and apply it, appropriately or not, to populations of all living creatures. From here come the terms that still shape how we account for evolution, competition for scarce resources, a struggle for existence, excess creatures being selectively culled for their relative lack of fitness, and, by the sixth edition, Herbert Spencer's Survival of the Fittest. Darwin saw that this culling of the unfit would inevitably lead to a greater fitness in those that remained, resulting in the preservation of favorable races or variations within the population and, in time, even of species. Darwin started out as a collector, mainly of beetles. Species in the wild are distinguished in collectors' minds by a short list of identifying features or characteristics. Noting how such lists of key characteristics resemble the characteristics selected for by livestock breeders, and pigeon fanciers, he set himself to find in nature some process analogous to that used by the breeders. At the commencement of my observations, it seemed probable that a careful study of domestic animals and of cultivated plants 
would offer the best chance of making out this obscure problem, the means of modification and co-adaptation of species. As has always been my practice, I have always sought light on this head from our domestic productions. We shall find here something analogous. Why is he so sure? There is no reason why the principles which have acted so effectively under domestication should not have acted under nature. In the survival of favoured individuals and races, during the constantly recurring struggle for existence, we see a powerful and ever-acting form of selection. <clears throat> Artificial breeding worked by a breeder selecting in each generation creatures whose characteristics vary in the way the breeder wants. For such a process of selection to work on natural populations, there have to come with variations like that too. But because selection results in less favoured variations getting eliminated, new variations must every so often pop up to replace them. Do they? Darwin assumes they do. Such variations should sometimes occur in the course of thousands of generations. If such do occur, can we doubt, remembering that many more individuals are born than can possibly survive, that individuals having any advantage, however slight over others, would have the best chance of surviving and of procreating their kind. On the other hand, we may feel sure that any variation in the least de degree injurious would be rigidly destroyed. This preservation of favourable variations and the rejection of injurious variations I call natural selection. So far, so good, and surely such a progress, a process, is likely to operate, at least to some extent, in populations of living creatures, just as when physical objects rub against one another, there's bound to be friction. However, although whenever an automobile moves, there's bound to be friction, that doesn't mean friction is what makes it go. Similarly, there may always be some competition for scarce resources in living populations, but that doesn't mean that's what makes them evolve. How does Darwin deal with this? He simply says, I am convinced that natural selection has been the most important means of modification. Are you convinced? In what does Darwin's originality lie? In the origin of species, I see him making four main claims. One had already been well established by others, that the origin of species lay not in special creation, but in natural processes operating on earlier species. Another claim already, also already proposed by quite a few others was that living creatures give rise to new species not by a sudden creation, but quite gradually. Third, and this seems to me the one assertion he had the right to suppose was original with him, was that natural selection operating on natural variation could account for most of the steps in the graduation of races, varying only a little, up to the level of species, hence the full title of his book, On the Origin of Species by Natural Selection, or The Preservation of Favoured Races, Varieties, in the Struggle for Life. His fourth claim, for me the boldest, and one for which he had the least evidence, in fact none at all, 
was that given enough time, what accounted for the evolution of varieties and species could also account for evolution, for gen graduations of types of living creatures, all the way from the level of species up to entire kingdoms. I see no reason to limit the process of modification to the formation of genera alone. He may see no limit, but we can. We can see new species coming into existence through selection among existing variants, alleles, of existing genes. But where would new genes come from? Bear in mind the simple process that was our common ancestor may have had a genome only a few thousand nucleotides long, whereas ours is three billion. How selection went on among that protus few thousand nucleotides may have nothing to tell us about where the rest of that three billion came from. Darwin had no way of appreciating the magnitude of the problem he was facing. Darwin notoriously detested revising his book. His revisions reveal why they forced him to acknowledge aspects of evolution it was hard to make natural selection account for. Grappling with such problems drove him more and more into becoming a Lamarckist. One example was disuse. Features a creature no longer needed tended over time to be lost. Parasites, for example, will over time lose characteristics needed for free living, their genomes shrinking by loss of the genes supporting those characteristics. Feeling obliged to explain how natural selection could account for such losses, Darwin resorted to placing on natural selection a burden far beyond what he had originally proposed. Instead of having to select for only a spotter's guide's worth of characteristics, it had to be evaluating for fitness every single one of a creature's characteristics, every feature by which every organ worked, that it needed to stay alive so no longer ca needed characteristics could be identified and eliminated. Instead of selecting for just a few characteristics, now billions. No way was that within natural selection's capacity. And Darwin began to embrace Lamarck's idea that creatures could evolve because of what they wanted, because of choices they made. I see this appearing already in his theory of sexual selection, illustrated by peacocks' tails growing larger over time, because that's how peahens liked them. I would have thought the decrease of fitness in the line of descent from those females would lead to the elimination of females with this unhealthy pre preference, but Darwin seems to have assumed that creatures' desires could have more influence on how they evolved than natural selection. I approached the origin of species for the second time, searching specifically for answers to the most obvious questions, choosing to read the sixth and last edition to get Darwin's latest thoughts, what I found instead was a muddle. He introduces scattered references to habit, a term more associated with Lamarck, but without clearly relating it to his mechanism. He includes an entire chapter of answers to questions posed by readers of prior editions, but curiously, these do not include what I thought to be the most obvious questions. He includes entire chapters to support one or another of his claims, but he doesn't tell you up front which. You can find yourself getting bogged down in oceans of boring detail that have nothing to do with all that interests us today, natural selection. My impression is 
natural selection never again made even what little sense it did in the first edition. Here are claims Darwin employs in his conclusion in the sixth edition to summarize how natural selection works. I suggest reading them carefully to assess how reasonable you find them. As each species tends by its geometrical rate of reproduction to increase inordinately in number, and as the modified descendants of each species will be enabled to increase by as much as they become diversified in habit and structure, so as to be able to seize on many and widely different places in the economy of nature, there will be a constant tendency in natural selection to preserve the most diversified offspring of any one species. Hence, during a long continued course of modification, the slight differences characteristic of varieties of the same species tend to be augmented into the greater differentiates differences characteristic of the species of the same genus. My reaction on rereading the origins is that the more I am exposed to explanations of how natural selection works, the less I understand it. And now I find that my failure to understand it is due not so much to inadequacies in subsequent attempts to elucidate it, but to weaknesses in arguments in the origin of species itself. Given that, I see little for which to celebrate Darwin as a scientist, as opposed to his genius as a naturalist and his ingenuity as an experimentalist. I suggest the origin of species, along with Darwin's proposed mechanism, be relegated to the category of dead ends in the history of science. Some of caution, Darwin's cautions about reliance on glib cliches he might have applied to himself. It is so easy to hide our ignorance under such expressions as the plan of creation, unity of design, etc., and to think that they give an explanation when we only restate a fact. For me, the same has become true of the struggle for existence, survival of the fittest, and adaptation to the environment. <laughs>